So today, I want to talk about nurturing revival. And I'm going to say some big mouthfuls with a few words. And uh, I pray for open ears and open hearts and that your inner person is ready to receive. <clears throat> so it's great to have unity in praise. Uh, let's start out with Psalm 133. And it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down to the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life evermore. So we'll talk today a little bit more about revival and how to nurture revival. One of the hallmarks of revival is that other Christians will attack an outburst of the Holy Spirit. Why do you suppose that is? Well, I suggest that the Holy Spirit is moving in a way that their religiosity does not identify as a move of God. <clears throat> Tradition is stronger than truth. Yeah, you preached on that. That's good. When our Lord and Savior was on the earth, with whom did he have issues? The religious people of the day. What did he call them? A generation of vipers. And he said they were of their father, the devil. So when you meet other Christians, what's your posture? Are you joyful? Or are you on guard? Do you try to find out where they go to church and what they believe? Do you look for things that are different from your beliefs? Or do you look for things that are in common? So I believe we are in a time right now and moving forward when we need to look for commonalities and perhaps sidestep some of the things that are different. Not because we don't need to talk about that eventually at some point, but because we're coming into a season where if we don't stick together, What's the point? So, does anyone think that the Lord would approve of one of us browbeating someone who doesn't believe in tongues or miracles or transubstantiation or healings or laying on of hands? Those are just a few examples. Much the same as if we are attacked by people who don't believe in the things we believe and they can't let it go, perhaps we need to let them go and pray that the Holy Spirit is with them and as they continue their journey, perhaps they'll receive more revelation. Perhaps not, but it's not up to us. How good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Ephesians chapter 4 uh, uh, says... I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It says, I beseech. What does beseech mean? So you ask someone urgently and fervently to do something. So it says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And in Ephesians 4.30, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Sounds good. But this is one of the areas that will need some work. I need to work on this stuff in my life. Reading those last three verses, I would infer that in order to grieve the Holy Spirit, one only has to ignore these verses. This is internal stuff. This is all Christian stuff. The folks referred to in these verses might be sitting across the table from you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then what? Will that be an awkward conversation? Or do we need to get it right here, right now? So I know that families are peaceful and loving and never fight or throw things at each other. But the Lord said it's important to keep the peace and to keep sweet. It's a job of Satan to stir up strife and envy and pride and discontent. So if we are truly fighting the good fight, it's imperative to operate in the opposite spirit. I know revival sets off those religious spirits into a frenzy, and it's a frenzy of destructive activity. How can we tear this thing down? How can we divide these people up? How can we make it just stop? Because it's just out of control, this God thing. Those spirits want the worship of the master to be tightly controlled. They want it to fall neatly within the lines that they have drawn with their crayon. But the Holy Spirit may show up to church and set its hair on fire and run around the room. That's okay, because it's the Holy Spirit. Does whatever he wants. It's good. We want to welcome that. We want to nurture that. We want to grow that. So the collective speech of every anti-Christ movement is orchestrated by religious spirits. And they have order and rules and way of doing things. And they say to you, don't make a move, unless I give you the nod and the wink, and it's OK. No, it's not. It's corrupt. It lends itself to religious hierarchies and levels of authority. And those mimic the levels of authority in the second heaven where the devil and his angels operate. Thankfully, the word says in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 4, but God. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, when the Holy Spirit not only comes to church, but sets their hair on fire and runs around the room, things begin to shake. Those spirits can't stand it, because they don't know what's going to happen next. And they can't stand that. It's quite a thing when hundreds of thousands of people move to the new world to get away from that religious hierarchy and nods and winks and nudges and got here and here we are 300 years later and we're kind of repeating history. So thinking about nurturing a revival, uh, lest some well-meaning soul try to stamp it out, here's a quote from Winston Churchill and I think it applies. If you will not fight for right when you can easily win without bloodshed, if you will not, 
when your victory is sure and not too costly, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight with all the odds against you and only a precarious chance of survival. There may even be a worst case. You may have to fight when there is no hope of victory because it is better to perish than to live as slaves. So how far down that road are we now? We're not exactly where Mr. Churchill was because we find ourselves in a unique position. Victory is ours. That is not in doubt. The battle is not ours but the Lord's. But we better be sure we're properly positioned on his side and we're not trying to stand in front of the train when he's going down the tracks. We better make sure we're lined up with him and we're going the same direction. Otherwise, we're just going to get run over. Oh, splat. It would be Wiley Coyote. Anyway, that's the end of part one. So on to perhaps a little lighter frame. Um, so a few years ago, I worked in a call center and uh, we took phone calls and answered emails and some people opened letters and gave credits to people on their account. On any given afternoon, about three in the afternoon, we'd have about 200 people in the building. And morale at the time was fairly low because there was a lot of rules and regulations. You couldn't do your knitting and you couldn't have a coffee at your desk and you couldn't read books. You had to just do the work. Uh, uh, strange, I know, but that was terrible for morale, apparently. Um, <clears throat> they all seemed like normal privileges to a lot of folks, but anyway. So it was decided that uh, we would get a special exception for our center and we would be allowed coffee at our desks as opposed to strictly bottled water and coffee in a spill-proof mug, whatever. Anyway, so in order to introduce this change, they decided to throw things from the roof. It's a two-story building, and so they were gonna throw a bottle of water off the roof, and obviously that wasn't gonna do anything, and then they were gonna throw a cup of coffee off the roof. So they did that, they got it all lined up, and we actually even reached out to our clients that we were working for and got special permission. We took extra people off the floor to go outside and watch the spectacle of these things being thrown off the roof. I don't know, it just seemed like a morale booster at the time, because it's great to just watch people throw things off the roof, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, then they got carried away and they threw a mannequin off the roof, and that was just, you know, now they've just launched into craziness because you could. Um, and then, of course, for years after, it was, do you remember the day they threw the mannequin off the roof? And they had videos. They showed how the coffee cup landed on the ground and it didn't blow apart and no coffee came out of it. And they posted it so everybody could watch the video over and over again. It was a spectacle. So what are my takeaways from this? Have you thrown Jesus off the roof lately? Uh-oh, Mackenzie's lost it. Blasphemy. But I may not be fully in touch with reality in every measurable way, but we need to lift up Jesus. He was once lifted up on a Roman cross, the largest, most powerful government on earth at the time, made a spectacle of our Savior. And by doing so, played right into his hands. His victory over every foe is complete. His resurrection is everlasting. And his free gift of salvation continues to be on offer. Are we getting the message out? Are we throwing Jesus off the roof? Is the name of Jesus in front of people? Are we making him a spectacle or is the Roman Empire still doing more to lift up Jesus than we are? Something quiet in here. I don't know what's going on. So I, I fell into a bucket of Winston Churchill quotes this week. So here's another one. There are a terrible lot of lies going around the world, and the worst of it is that half of them are true. So we have access to some pretty powerful tools these days. We have, we're inundated with so much information, some of it's actually true, or a close relative of truth. So what's our message? What are we putting out there? 
Are we at least saying we're in favor of Jesus? Uh, now, I saw an invitation that was passed through the inbox. I don't know if it was this week or maybe last week, inviting you to perhaps share your testimony. And perhaps that's something that you could do. Maybe it's something you don't want to do. Maybe you don't want your testimony shared on social media. Maybe having your story out there is not your thing. But here we are in September of 2021, and what's your plan to lift up Jesus? We've got a bunch of secular occasions coming up. <clears throat> We've got a new federal holiday on the 30th of September. I'm not sure if everybody's aware. It's called the uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And then, of course, there's Thanksgiving and Remembrance Day and one of the old all-time favorites, Christmas. Could we use any of those occasions, perhaps, to make a spectacle of Jesus? Public health orders and all, <clears throat> but we can still have a small gathering in our homes, and we can invite a few folks, and our country has many traditions that are rooted in Christian traditions, so why not just talk about Christ, the Anointed One, the Savior? So looking at some of these holidays, I mean, the very concept of truth and reconciliation is biblical. And the empires that sent people to this land certainly need to be truthful and make an effort to reconcile our barbaric past with the present. And Thanksgiving, well, we have lots to be thankful for, and sadly, we're not overly thankful. Remembrance Day. <clears throat> People have this idea that Remembrance Day is about guys who went overseas and died for their country. Well, the truth is actually found in John 15 and 13, which says, <clears throat> greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. So ask any vet anywhere if they were willing to lay down their life for the Canadian flag or lacrosse or hockey or pumpkin pie and 99 times out of 100 that's a hard no but if you ask them if they die for their brothers in arms or their sisters in arms sure 30 days out of 30 so if any vet you'll find is even willing to discuss it it's an age-old segue to the sacrifice of the master because he certainly laid down his life for his friends. And then, of course, there's Christmas. It's always been a ready-made to talk about the Savior. And if all that doesn't work, think about throwing Jesus off the roof at New Year's. Flag Day, Valentine's Day, Easter's coming up, Islander Day. But don't wait too long because right now the Roman Empire's beating you. And they've had a couple of thousand years head start. So that's the end of part two. It's so quiet in here. It's like crickets all. Yeah. Anyway. So last time I was up on this platform, we talked about Ruth chapter one. And last week in Elmsdale, I talked about Ruth chapter two. But for Sherry, it's going to be a rerun. For all the rest of you, it's the first time. <clears throat> So just in review, in Ruth chapter 1, we learned that Naomi and her husband Elimelech were having a difficult time in Canaan. Canaan is a type of the Lord's house or the church. So while they were having difficulty, they found out that there was bread down the way in Moab. And this is a type of the world and the things the world has to offer. So with intentional or maybe unintentional blindness, Naomi and Elimelech left Canaan and went down to Moab. And when they woke up spiritually in Moab, they were surrounded by all types of difficulty. Ultimately, Naomi lost her husband and her two sons. Left alone with her two daughters-in-law, she decided to turn back to Canaan or, I'm going to say, fall into revival. So she said, okay, I'm going back to God. Going back where I came from. Turning my face back toward God. And... <clears throat> Orpah went back to Moab, but Ruth, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you 
or turn back from following you. For wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And enough said. That was a, there was nothing else to say after that. So here we are in Ruth chapter 2. And in order to get the story, I'm going to read a few verses, but certainly not all of the chapter. Uh, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And um, basically, Ruth had learned from her mother-in-law about some of the rules of gleaning. And the rules were, when a farmer goes into the field, he doesn't go right into the corner. They weren't using GPS, obviously. And they don't go right to the edge of the field. So they leave a little bit in the corner and a little bit at the edge for people who didn't have as much so they could come into the field and get some food. And that was, that was what she was doing. She was going into the fields to glean. So after the reapers had already gone through and done their thing, she was going in to gather up whatever. So <clears throat> she ended up in a field that was owned by Boaz. And uh, in verse 5, Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. So it seems everybody knew Naomi was back, but who is this lady? Oh, this is Ruth. Okay. So Boaz, of course, learned all about her. In verse 8, he says uh, to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Uh, down in verse 9, Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. In verse 10, So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And... Boaz basically told her he knew all about her, knew the whole circumstance, knew everything. And, uh, yeah. So, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip down. Uh, verse 17, she gleaned in the field until evening. Verse 18, then she took it up, went to the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. So, uh, verse 23, so she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law, dwelt with her mother-in-law. So it seems that Ruth, after her journey with Naomi, there was a transfer of knowledge from Naomi to Ruth. The laws of Moses told the, the, the farmers, as I said before, not to go to the edges and not to go to the corners so the poor could come out. And uh, Ruth, knowing this, asked for leave from her mother-in-law to go out into the fields to gather. So when I was a little guy, I was probably six or seven or eight, uh, my mother had a good friend. They talk on the phone every day. And her good friend's husband was uh, a guy who drove a tractor that towed a windrower for one of the largest potato farmers around, uh, Horace Willis. And so we had advanced knowledge every day, every farm field, where these guys were going to be with all their gear and all their trucks and everything. So in the evening, my dad and I would put some buckets and some fish pans, uh, take it with the back seat of the VW Bug, and off we'd go with my sisters, and we'd go to the field that was harvested that day, sometimes just an hour or two before, and we'd gather up potatoes. And we'd fill our buckets and our fish pans, and we'd take them home and put them in the basement in some sand, and we had potatoes for the winter. It was gleaning. It's the same idea as here. So, here was Ruth, and she came upon this particular field, and the owner of the field saw her and said, Ha, who's she? Where'd she come from? What's she doing here? And of course, his guy, his foreman, knew exactly what was what. She knew who, exactly who she was, where she came from, her whole story. So it was just like every little small town and village around these parts, people know what's what. People know who's who. And... <clears throat> She had a little bit of revelation of the laws of God, of how things worked in the kingdom. She knew enough to feed herself, which is good. So you're, if you're in the field of the Lord and you're feeding yourself, 
the Lord is going to grant you favor. And he's going to say, stay in my field. I'm going to give charge concerning you to the other workers in my field. And I'm going to tell them to protect you and to water you and to keep you fed and looked after. So don't go over into the other field. So the straight line analogy from A to B says, stick with the Lord. Don't go looking for your spiritual needs in some other field where the owner of that field doesn't care about your soul and doesn't care where you end up and actually wants your destruction. Stick with the Lord, stay in his field. He doesn't use GPS. He doesn't cut right to the edge and he doesn't cut into the corners. He leaves some for everyone. And <clears throat> as with the example, if you want to read on your own time in Ruth, he even gave some parched corn, some good stuff to her directly and not just the trailings and the, the bits and the edges. He gave her the good stuff. And you'll get the good stuff too if you stick in the Lord's field. But if you go wandering, well, sure, it might be filling momentarily, but I'm thinking it's more like popcorn and not like steak. It's just not going to have that stick to your bones kind of thing going on. Your spiritual bones, of course. Right, Ian? Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> is that you today? Have you come out of a life of darkness? Have you joined yourself to some folks who are having a revival? Have you learned a little bit about the promises of God? Are you just beginning to step into some of those promises? This is the story of possibilities. When you are faithful in a little, the Lord of the harvest recognizes your faithfulness. I'm here today to tell you, if you choose a life of holiness, if you stand on the promises of the master, oh, how good it will be. The favor of the Lord of the harvest will be shining upon you, offering you a place to belong, a family, a young women who will be your community, young men who will offer protection. The Holy Spirit is here wanting to touch you today and wants to seal you and say to you, you are blessed. Would to God that you would get just the smallest sense of how much the Lord of the harvest wants to show you favor. So that's the majority of what I wanted to talk about today. We talked about the deliberate unity in the body of Christ. <clears throat> we want to keep building bridges. We want to think about building bridges, building relationships with Christians, and establishing good, strong relationships. Because if the Holy Spirit breaks out, perhaps before they freak out and go to their religiosity, maybe they'll talk to you about it first. And you will say, absolutely, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, he did set his hair on fire. Yes, he did run around the room. Everything's fine. Don't panic. And we talked about making a spectacle of Jesus. Throw Jesus off the roof. He's not going to get hurt. We know he pops back to life anyway. It's fine. He, not a bone of him will be broken. It's great. They've already done everything they possibly could to him. You're not going to hurt him in any way. It's Jesus. So throw him off the roof. Just make sure pop what people are watching. Get a video if you need one. Maybe you can send out the link. People can watch it several times and get the idea. He's not going to be destroyed in any way, shape, or form. He's indestructible. And we talked about Ruth and some of the traditions of the people of Israel and Canaan and how staying in the field of the Lord is important. And don't go getting your spiritual food in other places. And the parched corn from the field of the Lord is better than anything the world has to offer. 
Ryan, is there any chance you could come and strum some, some notes for me? Because we're not done, but we're getting there. And uh, I do have some scriptures that I'd like to speak over you, some blessings, and it's not what I normally do, and it's not what Pastor Bill normally does. This is more directed stuff. Um, yeah, Jeremiah 17 <clears throat> says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. So this is a blessing. If you're trusting in the Lord and your hope is in the Lord, you're blessed. And it also says, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green. It will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So you're trusting in the Lord, your hope is in the Lord, you're rooted and grounded in the actual river of life. And that river of life gets an uptake in your roots, it comes through your trunk right out to your leaves, and it doesn't matter if the forest fire comes, and it doesn't matter if the drought comes. You can't be destroyed, because you're fed from root to crown by the river of life. And in Numbers, chapter 6, the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Wow. That's quite a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Hmm. Give you peace. And in John chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. I know a lot of people don't think Christians have rights. I see one. I see one here. Gave them the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God, birthed of God. And of course, one of our old favorites in Psalm chapter 91. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give you, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I think we need to stand for the rest. It's good to rest and sit under the blessing of the Lord, but it's also good to stand and receive. If you want to receive the rest of this stuff, just hold out your hands like you're going to receive something. In Psalm 107. Anybody having any trouble today? Because it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. All oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Thank you, Jesus. And in 2 Samuel, chapter 22, we've got to write a song about this, Ryan. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, 
my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Thank you, Jesus. In Philippians chapter 4, and the peace of God, which we all totally understand. No. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And in Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And in 2 Corinthians, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Thank you, Jesus.